In a Jesus, Ephesians chapter 5, a Jesus. That's right. That's what you get when you eat Cheetos. A Jesus. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to be in verses 1 through 14. Before we get there, I'd like to inform you that we did go to the evangelism conference this week, uh, Monday and Tuesday. There's a few things that I found out about some of the folks that we go to church with. Number one, Terry Stohan snores. <laughs> So uh, that was interesting, and if he was here this morning, I would be calling him out. But uh, And number two, they said at the evangelism conference, they said that now there are Christian nations, other Christian entities around the world who are sending missionaries to the United States. Countries like South Korea are sending missionaries to the United States. And I went, duh, there she is, young he. So um, we had a good time. The messages were, were awesome. The breakout sessions were inspiring, and I'm glad that we got to go. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, that is not good, not right, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. Amen. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore, he says, Awake thou that sleep, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. I pray that you continue to bless us here this morning as we seek to hear from you. This I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, our service seems to be going a little long, so I'm going to preach fast so y'all listen fast. <laughs> right? we got to beat the Methodist to the cafe now. Oh, right? <laughs> Very often in life, we imagine that being successful has to do with being in a position of authority. And the Lord Jesus spoke to this. He spoke to authority uh, with his disciples when James and John sought out places of authority in that future kingdom that he would bring in. Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45 says this. But Jesus called them to him and said unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. Listen what Jesus said, But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be chief of all shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for men. Amen. Now listen, God's ways, they are nothing like the world's ways. Amen. And if you're going to be great in God's economy, if you're going to be great in God's kingdom... That is not to exercise dominion over others. Rather, it is to serve one another. In the world, success is always defined by excess, is it not? In the world, uh, success is defined by excessive lifestyles which indulge the appetites of the flesh. In the world, success is defined by excess in money, excess in riches, excess in glory, and especially excess in having power and holding authority. But the, the Lord Jesus said that among the Gentiles, among those who do not know God, he said they love to rule over each other. Isn't that true? Yeah, they love to rule over each other. Among the lost, there are men and women. They have only one desire. They always want to tell other people how they should live their lives. Yeah, right? Frustrating, isn't it? They always want to tell other people how to live their lives, and they want to rule over us. They want to control every part of our lives. Excuse me just a minute. There's something in my eye. It's your finger. It's my finger. Thank you, honey. 
There are people who want to rule over every part of our lives. They want to rule over us because they believe, wrongfully I might add, they believe that they're able to determine what is best for us better than we are able to determine that for ourselves. It's downright insulting sometimes. And if you don't think that this is true or this is the way of the world, I'll just remind you of the endless laws, the endless regulations that we have given to us by the government of this land. Endless laws and regulations on things that really there should be no like wearing a seatbelt. Wearing a seatbelt. Did we really need a law to tell people they need to wear their seatbelt? Buying insurance, things like that. And I'll remind you of how much that our government likes to add more and more endless laws and regulations so that it can expand its control. And I believe that we live in the best country in the world. That's why me and Norman did what we did this morning. Amen. We live in the best country in the world because of the freedoms which have been provided to us by our God. And the freedoms which have been provided uh, to us through godly men who wrote and gave us our constitution. But there are still men and women in this country, and they desire absolute power. They want absolute power. They want absolute control. And get this, absolute power corrupts absolutely. I recently read a statement concerning the government's abuse of power in this day and age. It went like this. The government believes that something not under its control is out of control. So it seeks absolute control. Get that? We live in an age in which the government thinks that if they don't have control of something, it must be out of control. So it is seeking absolute control. But what happens when someone is given absolute control? That's right. Here it is. But here again, I remind you that God's ways are not like the world's ways. Amen? Amen. I mean, God is the only true sovereign power in the universe. That means he has absolute control. Get that? God is sovereign. He has absolute control. And yet... Even with absolute power and absolute control, our God cannot be corrupted. Amen? Especially in this day and age. The Bible says, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, that we have a high priest, the Lord Jesus, who is in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin, cannot be corrupted. Amen? I'm looking forward to the day when he rules and reigns. There won't be any special investigations when God's in charge. <laughs> Get this, the Lord Jesus has absolute power, and, and being a God, he can exercise complete control, and yet, get this, think about it, he doesn't force his will on anyone, does he? No. no. In fact, the one thing which clearly displays that we are created in the image of God more than anything else is the fact that we too have a free will. That's right. Thank you. We have the power to make our own choices in life. We have the power to make our own decisions in life. Every person in this room is sovereign in our own wills because that's the way God designed it. Amen. Now, that doesn't mean we always make the best choices, though, does it? You are free to choose. You're not free uh, to choose the consequences of your decision. And it doesn't mean that someone cannot impose their will upon us because people often try to do that, don't they? Remember, fallen men and women will always abuse power. Okay? Even still, when someone is trying to impose their will upon you, you can say no. I mean, honestly, no one can make you do something you really do not want to do. Um, how is this, you might ask? And what if someone threatened to kill me? Preacher, what if someone threatened to kill me? You know, if I didn't deny Christ and bow down to an idol. I mean, that's a reality in this day and age. You can lose your head if you don't bow to their idol. Right? Well, you can still choose death over doing that thing you don't want to do. I mean, your choices may be limited, but you, you still have a choice in the matter. And, and Christian history is littered with stories of men and women who chose to die rather than to deny their Christ. Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Listen to what Jesus, or listen to what the Bible says. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Listen to this last part. And they loved not their lives unto the death. In other words, whenever they were confronted with denying Christ or death, they chose death. 
God has given us a free will. And God doesn't impose his will upon us instead. Now listen, God chooses to place his will before us, and then he calls on us to follow him. He doesn't impose his will on us. He places his will before us and says, come follow me of your own free will and volition. We're all called, to, we're all, called all Christians are called to follow Christ. All Christians are called to willfully, willfully, willfully of our own volition submit to the Lord's will and willfully obey him and willfully follow him. And listen, if we're going to know success in this life, if we're going to know success in walking with Jesus, we've got to learn how to follow him. Amen. Look again what Paul writes in verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. That should be academics, right? Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. The Lord Jesus said this, Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, now get this, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Follow me. The problem that I find is that most people don't understand what the definition of a follower is. A follower is a person who follows someone else. Get this? A follower follows another's beliefs, another's teachings, another's example. I mean, I looked it up in the dictionary, and it gave several definitions, definitions of the word follower, all of which are appropriate to our greater understanding of what God has called on us to do by calling on us to follow him. The dictionary says a follower is a disciple. A follower is a disciple. You know what a disciple is? That's a person who is personally devoted uh, to a teacher or to a set of doctrines or to the leader of a movement. When we claim to be a disciple of Christ, you know what we're stating? We're stating to people that we are following Christ Jesus, and that means wherever he leads, wherever he leads. We're stating that we are personally devoted to Christ Jesus. We are stating that we have a real relationship with him. We are saying that we adhere to his teachings. We adhere to his doctrines. Here it is right here, folks. As followers and disciples, uh, we are saying that we are, a, uh, we are a part of the movement that's devoted to Christ. What do we call that? Christianity. Amen. All this, all this is summed up in this statement. We are followers of Christ. Followers of Christ. And the reason that I believe that there are many people, they don't understand what it means to be a follower, uh, is because they are not disciples of Christ. They do not follow in the disciplines of Christ. As in, they are not honestly devoted to Christ or his teachings. And, and I make this assumption based upon this one fact. Many people do not in any way, shape, or form give the word of God any precedence in their life. But if you're going to follow God... This is the book. Amen. And there are many people, they don't give God any, God's word, any precedence in their life. Here's what I'm saying. Though they claim to love Jesus, though they claim to be Christians, they've yet to display obedience in, to him in any degree whatsoever. What I'm talking about is what Paul's writing in verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. Let no man deceive you with empty rhetoric. For, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. What things is he talking about? He's talking about fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Uh, what does he say? Filthiness or foolish jesting. Uh, what, no uh, whoremongers or uh, unclean persons or covetous men. He's talking about people who continue in disobedience. People engaged in um, sinful nonsense that you find in the world. And even still, as they're engaging in the sinful nonsense of the world, going around telling people that they love Christ and they're Christians when all they really are is children of disobedience. Now listen, the Bible says if you're following Christ, you certainly can't be a child of disobedience. Amen. Amen. But people imagine they can be. What am I talking about here? Just what the Lord Jesus said when he confronted the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. So there are people who claim to be Christians, to follow Christ, only their lives bear no reflection whatsoever of just simple obedience to the word. These people's faith is all a facade. 
They are whitewashed tombs. That's what Jesus called them. They are cardboard Christians. And when they do bother to come to church, they're just making a show. It's all pretense. They don't have a heart for Jesus. They're not followers of Christ. They're just playing religious games. And the sad thing is, they think that we buy it because we're polite. Listen to me right now. If you come into church playing religious games, we all know it. The only person that's being fooled is you. We're just being polite. And honestly, those children of disobedience, they are, are nothing more than idolaters. What does it say here in verse 5? For you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God. Uh, people who play religious games, people who are Christians in word, not in heart and truth, they're nothing more than uh, idolaters. Um, most often, when, it, when they claim to be worshiping God, they are worshiping a God that they've made up in their own image, not the Lord Jesus Christ as presented to us in the words of the Bible. And here's why this is. They're worshiping a God in their own image because they don't know the word of God. They've never bothered to read the word of God. And they don't even care to know the word of God. Well, they have a favorite verse they like to, like to bring out when they want to make others think that they're spiritual. Most often it's this one. Judge not, lest you be judged. Yeah, we've heard that one. Well, just... Well, they'll just trot out that favorite verse that they learned when they were five, and they'll use it to try to make people think of them as spiritual and Christian. They don't know the word. They don't care for the word. You bring up something they've never heard before, and immediately they get dumbstruck. Wait, that's in the Bible? Why, yes. Haven't you read it? And then what they do is, not knowing the word, they just substitute their personal opinions for the word. Amen. And I want to add here, listen, they always substitute their opinions for the word. They always exchange their opinion for what it says in the word of God. They contradict, they blaspheme, they substitute their opinion for the word of God and they do this so that they can continue on uh, without guilt in their disobedience and yet go around telling people that they're Christians. And by the way, if you do that, you're the hypocrite the church everyone's complaining about. Amen? Amen? Go out and live like the world and call yourself a Christian. Wonder why people claim there are too many hypocrites in the church. And, and these pseudo-saints are very easy to detect, folks. You know, here's how you can detect a pseudo-saint. Someone who is substituting their opinion for the word of God. You're having a Bible study. You're having a discussion of spiritual things. You're reading the Bible and studying it. And they'll say, well, I don't believe God is like that. Or they'll say something like, well, I just, don't, I just don't feel that this could be true. And it's always in a response to the clear teaching of the Word of God. So wait a minute. Oh, I just don't believe God's like that. Hold on. Nope, still says it. God is like that. <laughs> you can't argue with the Word of God. Amen. I'll give you one highly controversial illustration. All right? Y'all just get ready to slide your toes because here it comes. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 says, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Tough one, right? By the way, I preached that verse in view of the call. You talk about brave. <laughs> the way to interpret scripture is to let the Bible speak for itself and say what it says. Amen. Right? And what does it say? I suffer not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority over the man. Key here is nor you still authority. Well, let me tell you something. There are some ladies, and none too few men, they have a problem with this verse. And they don't respond well to this verse. Right? And they'll say things like, well, you know, the Apostle Paul, he was a chauvinist and a misogynist. And uh, he, he was just reflecting the attitudes of that time. And really... This part of the Bible, you can just cross that out because that's not really a part of the world, a uh, word, uh, apparently, because God is behind the curve here. God's not up with the times. He doesn't know that we now have gender equality. And you know what? The ladies can do anything the men can. Well, yeah, that's true. In the world, not in the word. Amen. Right. Get that? It's true in the world, but not in the word. 
Well, I don't think that God here meant that women couldn't hold authority in the church or be a pastor in the church. All right. Now, as long as you are clearly presenting that this is your opinion and state that as such. In my opinion, I do not believe that, that or I believe that women can be fine pastors. That's my opinion. Uh, but the minute that you state this as biblical truth, you just crossed the line and created a God in your image instead of the one that's presented in the Bible. Now, that's not the only verse. You know, I'm just highlighting this verse. Uh, listen, uh, we can get into the dynamics of what this verse says and what it means to the church in another sermon. That's not the point of bringing that up. I just wanted to highlight one verse that many people choose to ignore or to substitute their opinion in place of just simple obedience to the Word of God. Amen. That's right. Amen. And that's not the only verse. Uh, another verse that people have problems with is the one that says that a pastor and a deacon ought to be the husband of one wife. Right? Uh, there are people and they have problems that, with verses that concern the nature of our mission and our witness to the world. Why? Because they'd rather enjoy the momentary pleasures of this world than to faithfully follow Christ. But they want you to believe that they are a follower of Christ. I'd just rather you be honest. If you're going to follow Christ, follow Christ. And if you're not, don't play. Right? Right? The point being that there are people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, and the truth is, they are not. And I just want you to know that if you're playing games, I know it. If you can't get by me, you ain't never going to get by God. I'm just a man. Amen. The only way to be a true follower of Christ Jesus is to faithfully adhere to the word of God. The only way you're ever going to truly follow Jesus is to follow Jesus by the word of God. You've got to keep those parts you like, but especially the parts you don't. you just got to trust that God knows what he's talking about. God knows what he's doing. And obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Followers do just that. They follow. They follow. Someone who's not genuine, who's not... Following Christ, they will usually desert Christ. They'll desert the church the very minute they hear something they don't like. The very minute they hear something from the word of God that they just don't want to believe or accept. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know about this preacher, but I know this. I ain't never coming back here. Uh-oh, what's God going to do now? Oh, wait, he's still God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Paul says, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. We're called to be followers. We're called to be followers. And then he continues. He says, walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. Now listen to this last part. And hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God. Get that? He says, Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us. Which means that if you're going to successfully follow Christ, you're going to have to put others' needs before your own. Right? Successful following is pursuing God to his glory, which always results in serving Christ Jesus. And the only way that you can serve Christ Jesus is by going out and being a servant to others. Amen. You are his hands and feet. Look what it says. For he had given himself for an offering and a sacrifice unto God. What did Jesus say? He did not come to be ministered to, but to minister. This means... You are not being a follower of Christ if you're always pursuing your own agenda. Well, this is a tough one. This is a tough one for a lot of people. But you can't follow Christ and pursue your own agenda. To follow the Lord Jesus, you've got to pursue his agenda. Remember, we're following. Right? I wonder, when I was reading, when I was studying this and it's talking about being a follower, you know, so many people, they, they'll put some advertising out there. Follow me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. I wonder how many people think God's following them on Twitter or Facebook. Is God your friend on Twitter? You know, if you thought that God was reading your post on Facebook, some of y'all wouldn't put half the stuff you put on there. <laughs> Isn't that true? Amen. Yeah. Amen. I don't understand that whole Facebook craze. Why would you want to air out your dirty laundry to you know thousands of people? I'll keep that to myself. Too many people, listen, too many people, they want God uh, to adhere to their agenda. They want God to pursue their agenda. They're not interested at all in God's agenda. They're not interested at all in God's will for their life. You see, they just substitute their own will for God's will and call it following God. 
whole church is full of people, and they're pursuing their own agenda, their own will, and they're saying, well, I'm following God. If you're following God, <clears throat> why is he behind you? If you're constantly pursuing your own agenda, I can tell you without hesitation, you're not following God and you're not walking in love. Well, maybe you are walking in love, in a form of love, but all that love you have is all for yourself and for no one else. Deny thyself, take up thy cross and follow him. Let me tell you, let me tell you now, when you can know that you are following God's will for your life and not pursuing your own agenda. It is when you can honestly and sincerely pray this. Not my will be done, Lord, but thine. That perfect example was given to us in Gethsemane. Where our Lord Jesus Christ said, oh, but this cup could pass from me. But not my will, Lord, but thine. That's the measure of a follower. Can you say yes to the Lord Jesus at any time for any reason when he calls upon you? I mean, can you say yes to the Lord Jesus if he calls you to go serve in a foreign mission field? And I specifically highlight this because some people think that that is the worst thing that could possibly happen to anyone. Oh, Lord, I've been called to Africa. Okay. Too many Christians put conditions on their follow through, right? Too many Christians put conditions on their follow through. And they'll pray something along the lines of, you know, Lord, I'll serve you. I want to serve you just as long as, uh, as I have this and that in my life. Or just as long as I never have to go to one of those Istan countries. You know what an Istan country is, right? Afghanistan, Pakistan, or oh my God, Noah's stand. Those countries, right? Put conditions on their follow through. There's no conditions to being a follower of Christ. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. No conditions to following Christ. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Therefore, where and when he tells me to, I must up and go. I made that up, by the way. We're proud of that. Successful following means walking in love and putting other needs, other desires, others good before your own. And successful following also means being distinct from the world. Look again at verses 3 through 7. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become of saints, neither filthiness nor foolish jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man, which is, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with empty words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be ye therefore, uh, be not ye therefore partakers with them. Listen, here's what it means. <laughs> We're followers of Christ, not followers of the world. Amen. I especially like what Paul says in verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness. That is, you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. We, we discussed this in Sunday school this morning. Listen, we are child of the king, and every time the Bible describes uh, uh, anything that has to do with God, it always describes it in majestic terms. His ma majesty, his excellence, his glory. We're child of the king. We ought to be marked by majesty and excellence and glory. Amen? Amen. Are you a child of the king? Amen, preacher. Amen. <laughs> Christians cannot have one foot in heaven and the other foot in the world. That just never works. Verse 11 says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. What that means is that our lives should stand opposed to the unfruitful works of darkness. There ought to be a clear distinction between those who are children of light and those who are still bound up in darkness. Listen to verse 13. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. That word manifest means clearly evident. All things that are reproved, all those things of darkness, are made evident by the light. Mm -hmm. What happens? You come into a dark room and you turn the light on. Everything that's in that room, you go in there, it's dark. You don't know what's in there. You turn the light on. All of a sudden, everything that's in there is fully exposed. Amen. Correct? Whatever doth make manifest is light. Whatever makes things evident is light. And, and that means the way that you and I live our life, lives for Jesus 
Listen, get this. The way that we live for Jesus, the way that we live our lives, it ought to expose, make manifest unfruitful works of darkness. Like turning the light on the room and seeing everything that's in there. Our lives ought to put people under conviction for how they're living if they're living in sinful darkness. Yes, they should. I mean, your life ought to make those who work the works of darkness ashamed of how they're living when they're around you. Now, I don't mean that we go out pointing at people and beating them over the head of the Bible and just pointing out their sins. Oh, you dirty. No, I'm just talking about living your life for Jesus in a way that when people are around you, uh, they are keenly aware of how they're living in darkness. Amen. Just last summer, I went to play at one of the golf tournaments they have in our country club. Wonderful country club. Love it person I was paired up had a cooler full of beer on his golf cart. And uh, so everybody introduced me. Hey, this is Pastor of First Baptist Church. And I put my clubs on his cart. I sit down. And he says, hey, does my drinking beer bother you? And I said, well, I care what you drink. Because that's the truth. Believe it or not, I'm not really personally involved in people I don't know's lives. Right? Neither are you. If you'll think about it. Right? <laughs> So, you know, I'm out there. I'm amongst people who don't know Jesus. I'm not sitting there judging them for what they have in their golf cart, right? What do I care? I didn't, okay? It didn't bother me at all. He could drink whatever he wanted to. But I think it was bothering him, wasn't it? You know how I know that? That's right. He asked me if it bothered him. He, he had to be somewhat ashamed or else would he ask me if it bothered me, him drinking beer. But that's not the only case. I mean, anywhere you go, um, foul language. People, you, oh, foul language is epidemic in the world today, isn't it? Now, even when you've got your kids in the grocery store, people won't stop. And I'm, I, when my kids are around, my grandkids are around, and someone's using bad language, I'll say, hey, this is my granddaughter, and I don't want her to hear that here in public. They get, some of them get mad, and some of them don't. But when I tell people that I'm a pastor, you know, if they come up and they're talking to me, and every other word is an expletive, and I say, hey, I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church, all of a sudden they start cleaning up their language. Right? That's because as Christians, our lives ought to make evident the unfruitful works of darkness. Not just, not just pastors, it's all Christians. Our lives ought to make evident the unfruitful works of darkness. And as Christians, our very existence reproves sinners in their sins. Unless, of course, the manner of your life is no different than theirs, then you're not reproving anyone by how you live. Get that? Verse 11 says that this shouldn't be the case. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Too many Christians today think that they can have one foot in heaven and one on the world. At church, they play the part of the Christian, but when they're out in the world, they look just like all the rank and file sinners. Their life is no different only when they're at church. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. What does that mean, preacher? I can't go out and have fun? Well, not like the world does. And then you have verse 14. Wherefore, he says, Awake thou that sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Amen. In other words, guess what? It's time to wake up. If you're stumbling around in this life in the dark, it's time to wake up and turn on the light. Amen? So if you're a Christian and you're not really living for Christ, it's time to change what you're living for. It's time to change how you're living. And I got news for you. You can't make that change. You got to come to Christ and let him make that change in your life. But you're not going to see any true change in your life until you honestly want it. You can pray all the heartless, meaningless prayers you want to. But until you reach that point when you want your life to be changed for Jesus, then you pray with earnest. And then the Holy Spirit says, let's make those changes. God doesn't play games. We do. You're not children of the darkness. You're children of the light. I mean, how wrong are Christians who are caught up in the world? They are living for the momentary pleasures of the flesh. They're engaged in the unfruitful works of darkness, doing the things which were shameful to even speak of. Mm. Stumbling along in the dark, though they are children of light. Unless, of course, they're not children of light. I mean, that's the only conclusion that I can come to. If you're out living in sin, living for the world, even if you claim that you're born again, that you have faith in Jesus Christ, but you, you just can't seem to live the Christian life, you're just playing games. You come to church and you act like a Christian, and the minute you leave church, you act just like the world. The only conclusion that I could come to, and it's just my opinion, 
but I value it. The only conclusion and opinion I can have is that you don't know Jesus. You're still in your sins. You know what the Bible says to this? Arise from the dead. Come out from the dead. If you're not living for Jesus, you're not living. <laughs> the Bible says you're dead. The only way you're going to have life is in Jesus. If you will come to Jesus, he will save you. He will deliver you from your sin. He will give life to your spirit. You will take a step into the life. You can keep stumbling around in the dark or you can come to the light. That's the choice before you. Remember, you have a free will. Amen. You can freely choose to follow God's will for your life. And I guarantee you the Bible says time and time again, it is God's will that you be saved. Yes, Lord. You can keep stumbling around in the dark or you can come to the light. That's the choice before you. The Bible says, Awake thou that sleep and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father and Sovereign Lord, thank you for this message. And I pray that if anyone needs to take that step into the light this morning, that through the power of the conviction and moving of the Holy Spirit, they will make that move towards you. Lord, if anyone's been playing games, I pray that today would be the day in which they decide that they're not going to play games with you any longer, that they will take a step into the light. Lord, change our hearts this morning. Turn our hearts to you. Let revival be renewed in our spirits today. This I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand up here for just a few minutes? Yeah.